现在系 Members， it is the appointed time and we have a quorum. Let me call the meeting to order. First of all, let us confirm the minutes. I believe members must have received the minutes, and the clerk has confirmed that there have been no proposals for amendment. May I ask members to confirm the minutes, please? No questions, right? Thank you. Next. After the regular meeting on the 7th of July 2014, the panel received seven information papers, and the titles of those papers are listed in the agenda. Now let us talk about the date of next meeting and the items for discussion. The next regular meeting would be held on the 1st of December. As you know, there will be four Um, different topics. First of all, briefing by the Financial Secretary on Hong Kong's latest overall economic situation. Number two, 2015-2016 budget consultation. Number three, proposed revision of fees and charges for services under the purview of the Customs and Excise Department. And fourth, proposed implementation of the first phase of the over-the-counter deri derivative regulatory regime in Hong Kong. Would you agree to taking up those items in our December meeting? Okay, thank you very much. Since we have a tight agenda for that meeting, we'll have to advance our meeting to 9:30 and end the meeting at 1 p.m. We will invite the financial secretary also to comment on the impact on the economy by the Occupy Central movement. Now, let us invite the、um, officials from the Monetary Authority to come in. We have Mr. Norman Chan and his team. 哦、oh, 哦、oh. ，OK， 哦，系黄国兴先，黄国兴议员啦、啊。Mr. Wong Kok Heng， 好，現在我歡迎啊 ！I like to welcome Mr. Norman Chan, Chief Executive of the Hong Kong Monetary Authority, and his team. Mr. Chan, can I now、uh, give the floor to you? 多謝主席。誒，各位議員早晨。Thank you, Chairman. Good morning, members. Today I will be、um, introducing the work of the Monetary Authority to you. In five aspects, number one, assessment of risk to Hong Kong's financial stability that will be done by myself. As you know, the international macro financial environment is very complex, and spearheading the economy worldwide will, of course, be the Fed and the U.S. monetary policies. If you look at this chart, and if you look at the scale of the balance sheet, the U.S. after having QE. The injection into banks, and that is、um, the expanding of the balance sheet, has been serious. And over the years, it has injected over three thousand billion U.S. dollars into the banking system, and the balance sheet rate、uh, has risen from six percent of GDP to twenty-five percent. This is what they call QE. As you know, they have just concluded the last. That buying exercise, and、uh, is said that they have withdrawn from the market. But later on, I will also be commenting on the rate of interest increase. Second, please look at the ECB, the chart in the middle in red. In fact, the ECB doesn't want to use the term QE, but the term credit easing. But in fact, it is going to make use of a little uh, different. Um, Methods in order to inject funds into the banking system in order to support revival of the economy. And as you can see, the ECB has done quite a bit of credit easing. In 2012, the scale of the balance sheet has taken up 33 percent of the GDP of the Euro region, compared to 25 percent of the US. You can see it is even higher. 
but recently, after some loans have been repaid, the rate has come down to 21 percent. But recently, it has again uh, announced that maybe over 10 billion euros would be injected into the banking system, and the BOJ of Japan has just said that uh, it will again increase its QQE scale. Uh, yes, please continue. Yes. Talking about QE, you might think that it started with the U.S., but if you look at the injection of um, funding into the, the banking system by the central bank, making use of an expanding of the balance sheet, in fact, Japan was the first to do it. So if you look at the chart in green on the right, in 07, 08, 09, the BOJ has already got the scale of the balance sheet at 22% of its uh, GDP. After Abe became prime minister, he thought that the previous QE activities were not exactly effective. So he asked the BOJ to do more. And the recent statistics is such that the balance sheet of BOJ has occupied 55% of the GDP. And he is saying that this is not enough, and every year, uh, actually, now 23% of the national debts have been bought by the BOJ, and I believe that proportion will just go up in the future. What are we facing now? It is a very complex situation indeed. The U.S. economy is continuing to revive. Its unemployment rate is continuing to improve. So uh, there will be no more QE. But then the ECB is uh, seeing a lowering of the inflation rate, and the BOJ would also like to boost its economy. So if you look at the three economies, they are developing at different paces. But that is not anything that is strange. We have seen that before. The only thing that is different now is that the three central banks have adopted policies of QE or credit easing, but then they are doing it at different paces. The U.S. has already withdrawn from the market. It has tapered uh, off its QE, but the ECB and the BOJ actually are going in the opposite direction. They want to do more. So the monetary policy of the world has become very complex. We have to study what the U.S. action will have on the uh, capital flow throughout the world. And then when these ECB and BOJ uh, are increasing credit easing, they might be impacting on the U.S. action. And what does it mean uh, for the Hong Kong economy? I think uh, the U.S. Fed will have more impact on Hong Kong. If we look at the last cycle, when uh, the interest rate cycle appeared in the U.S., you will see that capital will flow back to the U.S. from all over the world, including emerging markets. And there will be less liquidity in the emerging markets, and the U.S. dollar will become stronger, and the emerging markets will have their currencies uh, weakened, and so there will be a, a tightening of liquidity for the emerging markets. Now, I talked about the interest rate rise. The Fed has said that they will not buy debts anymore. However, its balance sheet is not going to shrink. Um, matured debts will again be reinvested. Now, as to when the interest rate rise will take place, there will be a lot of uncertainty because according to the Fed, it is said that it will wait until quite a bit a, a uh, quite a long time before it will have interest rise after the QE is stopped. Uh, Janet Yellen said about a considerable period of time. It might be six months, but then she refused to comment anymore. And then the deputy chairman said it may be from two months to one year, and that still could be considered a considerable period of time. Now, you, this chart is a little complicated. On the left, it is a forecast by end 2015, and that is uh, the Fed fund rates forecast. The one on the right is forecast until end 2016. You can see two lines, the red one with uh, round dots. That has to do with the Fed fund's futures, and this is the implied rate. And the one in blue 
every time when the Fed members had have meetings, they would do a forecast, and this is the median forecast that they would announce. Now, what is uh, strange here is that by end 2015, by end 2016, if you look at the market futures implied rate and also the Fed median forecast, there is always a distance. The market implied rate will be lower and the Fed's median forecast rate is higher. And we are all trying to explain why there is a gap between the two. Some people are saying that the Fed has always said that after withdrawing from the market uh, for a considerable period of time, there will be no interest rate. Uh, we call this uh, forward guidance. And they say it is so effective that the market would totally have trust in this and therefore they are of the view that the interest rate rise um, in terms of scale and timing, uh, it will be slower than their own forecast. So under that kind of uh, background, what will happen to the market? Before October, uh, market sentiments were optimistic generally. We all thought that there would not be any interest rate rise soon in the mark in the US. But then after October, there is volatility in the market. Uh, you can see that the S&P has uh, seen a lot of volatility or fluctuation. On one day, it dropped by 3%. On another day, it increased by 2%. So this is an increase in volatility and would reflect the uncertainty in terms of forecast of interest rate rise. And then uh, the futures market and also commodities prices. The index also fell quite a bit. It fell 14% since the June high. And crude oil prices also fell very much. Uh, the Brent crude oil price fell more than a quarter. Uh, and that is 25%. As for U.S. high yield bonds, in the uh, last few months, the spread uh, was widened by 173 basis points. And even the 10-year U.S. Treasury uh, yield, uh, it fell from 2.2% to 1.9% on the same day, and then it rebounded uh, towards 2.1% in one single day. Actually, the 10-year U.S. Treasury uh, is actually the one with the last, largest circulation. Now, that would mean that as we near the interest rate rise cycle, the assets markets would be sensitive. Even if there is a small message, uh, even if the Fed has not exactly um, increased interest rate, the market reaction will be strong. Let me now turn to the mainland. It is clear that uh, the mainland economy growth has eased. Let us look at the chart on the left. It is the property market. The blue bars are the sale figures. You can see that year on year, the sale figures are dropping, and the red line represents the house prices. We know that uh, they are being adjusted in 70 cities. 69 have recorded a drop in house prices. So you can see it is clear that the property market is easing. And then the chart on the right has to do with fixed asset investment. Again, the growth is slowing down, especially infrastructure FAI and real estate FAI. We can see uh, clearer drops, but then they are still in the black. It is just that the growth has become slower. Even if uh, the mainland economy is slowing, there is no risk or, or very little risk of uh, a hard landing. And I'd like to talk about the PMI. Whether it be non-manufacturing PMI or manufacturing PMI, you can see that they are very stable. Manufacturing at 50, and it is recording a very slow growth. And non-manufacturing, it is about 53, 54. And then the chart on the right, it talks about aggregate financing in the mainland. You can see uh, I have a dotted circle there. Uh, this shows that in July, whether it be bank loans or um, social financing, there has been drops and social financing uh, has recorded 
a, a red figure, but then it has gone back to a stable level in August and September. So the Hong Kong MA um, assessment is that the mainland economy has uh, grown slowly, but then there will be no risk of hard landing. Coming back to Hong Kong, I think we're all very concerned about the property market. I think members will recall that last year the ACR government adopted certain <coughs> uh, demand management measures and also we uh, launched the sixth round of anti-cyclical uh, you know, supervisory measures. And, and then we enjoyed a period of relief during which uh, transactions dropped by 20, 30 percent, and property prices also fell slightly. But starting from March this year, we saw that the property transactions has turned active again, and property prices again rose. And according to the figures, you'll find that for the first quarter of this year, every year we have a, <clears throat> an average of 3,000 odd transactions. In the second quarter, it went up to 5,300, and the third quarter, 6,600. So we are seeing a rising trend here. And for property prices, prices of <clears throat> uh, uh, small units went up <clears throat> more than the larger units. And uh, so what we need to analyze here is that even though we have a 12-month uh, relief period, but start since since March, property market market has become active again. Does it mean that in Hong Kong uh, we are seeing an upward cycle in the property market? Would it be that Hong Kong will <clears throat> the property market will become uh, uh, overheated again? So the, 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 the trend for the property market is still not certain. We need more time uh, to observe the, 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 uh, the trend. But our response is very clear. When we see that the upper cycle is continuing, we will continue. We will consider uh, adopting uh, uh, some uh, anti-cyclical measures. If we are uh, conf if we're sure that the trend is going downwards, we will adopt appropriate measures to relax the 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 the, uh, the uh, measures uh, in relation to 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 mortgages. Next, uh, <clears throat> the uh, we see also that the uh, uh, l loans, uh, f family loans, and we'll find that uh, that it has gone up 63 percent, which is a historic high. The pink section would be the mortgage, and you find a moderate increase, but it's not a very big increase. Uh, credit card advances, the blue uh, portion hasn't changed very much. Uh, I should mentioned that uh, uh, the, the other personal uh, loans or other private purposes like P loans and, and loans for tax payment, you'll find that the total amount is about 300 billion. So what does that mean? 300 billion uh, is double the amount in 2009. So over a period of four years, uh, the loans for private purposes has doubled. So overall, it has gone up by 21%. So we are concerned about this trend. And in January this year, we've already written to the banks, uh, asking them to pay uh, more attention to risk management for private loans, especially uh, credit risk. You have to, the banks would have to Look at the uh, the the ability of the creditors to repay, and also the loan to income ratio. Furthermore, the term of such loans, especially for these private loans, sometimes the term could be six to five, six to seven years. Perhaps the bank could consider shortening the the the, the, the term for, of such uh, loans. And this is not only uh, to uh, protect the quality of the bank's credit. But also, we also like to protect the creditors so that they will not uh, 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 borrow excessive, excessively. Another <clears throat> uh, factor would be the overall uh, credit uh, in Hong Kong. And I think we have reported members that in the first quarter of this year, the overall credit has gone rather rapidly. In the first quarter of this year, the annualized <clears throat> uh, uh, rate was almost 23%. But it fell to 14.6 percent in the second quarter. The latest figure for the third quarter is 7.7. .7. For the first three quarters, the annualized growth rate is 15.6 percent. 
So I think the the, the trend is uh, moderating. There are two reasons for that. First of all, demand has eased. That is, uh, the corporate demand for loans has uh, uh, dropped a bit, and also the banks are also attaching more and taught, more more vigilant regarding risk management, and therefore they are more cautious in extending loans. Last year, we already have a <coughs> steady capital requirement. That is, the banks were advancing credit too rapidly. They have the potential to credit risk, but they also need to manage uh, the uh, the liquidity. Carefully and to ensure that they have sufficient liquidity to support the rapidly expanding uh, credit that they extend, and I believe uh, uh, this will have an impact on the growth of credit. Since the overall growth of credit has slowed down, and this chart shows you the loan to deposit ratio. You'll find that for the U.S. dollar, Hong Kong dollar, and all currencies, the trend recently has been. Uh, reversing or, or slowing slowing down. Let me now next talk about the impact of the Occupy movement on the Hong Kong financial system. Uh, the first thing we need to pay attention to is the Hong Kong dollar exchange rate. Since we are packed to the US dollar, and the exchange rate has stayed <clears throat> all along at between 7.75 to 7.77. And, uh, and it's similar to the rate prevailing before the 20th of September when Occupy Central movement started, and there were no abnormal transactions. The high ball rate has also not changed very much. It has remained very stable. The payment system, every year we have $2,200 billion of transactions which are settled through the, uh, this system, and it's, the system is not operating normally. However, the business of the banks have been affected. On the 29th of September, 44 banks uh, had to temporarily close some of their branches or offices. Now, there, today, there is one bank in in Mong Kok, one one bank which has to close that that branch, the Mong Kok branch. As for the equity market, of course, the market has been going up and down, but there has not been uh, very much, uh, very significant changes. The index now, compared with 26th of September, you'll find that the in index has gone up a little bit. Looking at the turnover and the uh, and the uh, number of uh, uh, short sale, uh, uh, again, it has not uh, differed very much from the first half of this year. So that's the. Uh, impact on the financial system thus far. Uh, if I may now defer to Arthur to talk about banking uh, supervision. I'll now talk about banking supervision, uh, and I'll cover three areas. First of all, all these three areas would involve, <coughs> uh, you know, uh, legislative amendments. I think members would be familiar. First of all, that we need to implement the Basel Three arrangement in Hong Kong. Last week. Uh, the latest batch of subsidiary, subsidiary legislation has been submitted to LegCo. The latest amendments, we call it the uh, the, the implement the second phase implementation of the Basel Three arrangements, involving three major areas. First of all, implementing the uh, uh, the uh, other than the basic capital requirement, there will also be uh, the requirement for capital buffer, and also another longer subsidiary legislation is to implement the uh, uh, liquidity uh, assist, the sun, uh, buffer, and so we will implement that in Hong Kong uh, over a period of several years. We also have other legislative uh, amendments before we can fully implement Basel Three. For example, in the second stage, we would require – we have certain uh, disclosure requirements for the banks which have to be <coughs> uh, implemented by way of a subsidiary legislation. There are also some supervisory uh, documents to be issued, for example, the counter-cyclical capital buffer and the systemically important banks, we may need to increase the capital requirements. Uh, the amend the uh, the subsidiary legislation that we proposed last week, uh, that is during the second phase amendment, they will cover those areas. Other than the those uh, legislation, we are consulting the trade regarding 
uh, well, that, that we will need to yet, uh, you know, launch other, uh, you know, uh, uh, regulatory documents. Earlier, we also mentioned that uh, in Hong Kong, while we need to uh, implement cross-sector resolution regime for financial institutions in Hong Kong, that is when major financial institutions encounter uh, difficulties, how can we uh, deal with those uh, scenarios in order to lessen the impact on the, on, on the public uh, financial system. Uh, actually, a new standard was uh, uh, announced two weeks ago, and all uh, ju jurisdictions have to uh, come up with such arrangements. Hong Kong also will need to implement the, such international standards. When we came to the panel last time, we mentioned that we've just completed the first round of consultation and received a total of 33 submissions. Overall, uh, the, the responses were, were, were positive. The market and the public understood that we need to implement such measures. But there were some technical uh, details oper and te operational details uh, which will be included in the second round of consultation. We will consult the, the stakeholders for uh, in the second stage and we hope that we will be able to start the second round of consultation and by the end of next year we will be able to uh, put forward a legislative proposal to uh, to this council at the end of next year. The third uh, legislative amendment is how we can further enhance the deposit protection scheme. And in the middle of September, together with the uh, uh, Financial Service and Treasury Department, we launched a three-month public consultation. One of the major proposals was was the uh, the compensation mechanism of the deposit protection scheme. That is, we would deduct. Deduct the, from the uh, depositors' uh, balance the the that the, the amount he owes to the banks. Uh, in internationally uh, nowadays, uh, the trend is that we would pay according to the aggregate deposit by the depositor, would and that would uh, quickly speed up expedite the process of compensation. The purpose of the scheme is to restore public confidence. The faster we can uh, make the compensation, we would have uh, we would have more confidence on the part of the depositors. So the enhancement scheme aims mainly at uh, uh, change changing it into a, an act, a conversation on the basis of the aggregate deposit. The consultation will end uh, in December, and we hope that next year we will be able to uh, complete the legislative amendment process uh, and we'll submit the bill to let go. Regarding the development of the financial market, there are several de developments that we would like to report to this council. First of all, the development of Islamic finance. In September this year, we assisted the government in successfully issuing the inaugural one billion US dollar uh, sukuk. Uh, uh, so through the uh, AAA credit rating of the Hong Kong Government, we were able to uh, provide a good uh, benchmark for uh, pricing, and and issuance of the Islamic bond was very successful, and the yield was 2.005 percent, which is only 23 basis points over the five-year U.S. Treasuries. Other than Japan, uh, this. This yield is mo the closest to the yield of for the U.S. Treasuries, and uh, there was a strong demand from global investors, attracting orders exceeding 4.7 billion U.S. dollars. We will continue to maintain close dialogue with the market players and encourage other public and private sector entities to come to Hong Kong to issue the sukuk through our platform on coin collection. Uh, starting from the uh, October this year, uh, we have arranged for two uh, coin collection uh, trucks to go to the different districts in Hong Kong, and <clears throat> members of the public can receive bank notes in exchange for coins or top up the octopus cards or they can also donate to the community chest. The two cards proved to be very popular, and in October 
uh, they have visited seven districts, and as the 31st of October, 19,000 people have used the service, and we have collected roughly uh, 19 million pieces of coins with a total face value of $15 million. Uh, on average, we are collecting 740,000 pieces of coins each day and saving, helping the government save a lot on minting costs or expenses. Soon and uh, with regard to the settlement systems, the drafting of the Clearing and Settlement Systems Amendment Bill is in the final stage. The new regulatory regime seeks to ensure adequate protection of users' float maintained with um, stored value facilities issuers and the security and soundness of the operations of the SVF and the RPS in Hong Kong. The provisions include a licensing regime for SVF and a designation regime for RPS and also conferring relevant supervisory and enforcement powers on the monetary authority. The public consultation has concluded and the results have been published on the 31st of October 2014. In general, the public supported the systems. It is expected that the bill can be introduced into LegCo in February next year. Now I'd like to talk about Hong Kong as an offshore renminbi center. We are having a steady development in this front. If you look at the chart on the left, you will see that in the first three quarters of this month, renminbi trade settlement in Hong Kong reached 4,500 billion renminbi. Compared to the same period last year, and it, we see an increase of 73%. With regard to deposits and deposit certificates, we have a total of 1,120 billion renminbi. On the right, you will see renminbi financing uh, or trade settlement. You will see that it is more active. In the first three months, the renminbi dim sum debt issuance uh, reached $136 billion, or an increase of 40% over the entire last year. And in terms of renminbi loans, again, uh, you see a growth as well. If you look at the Navy parts, uh, it is renminbi loans. And by the end of September, we have 168.8 .8 billion renminbi, or a 40% rise from last year. If uh, we look at our renminbi business with other parts of the world, we see expansion again. I won't go into all the figures here in this chart, but you will see that whether it be the number of participating banks or business with overseas banks, you see growth uh, in all aspects. We'll continue to promote this kind of business together with London, um, Australia and Malaysia. We have already set up platforms, but recently with Thailand and Paris, we have also signed similar agreements for a cooperation platform in trading in renminbi. We'll continue to promote our Hong Kong as a trade platform using renminbi. We'd like to enhance offshore renminbi liquidity. Earlier on, we introduced two main measures. Number one, to have a intraday renminbi liquidity in order to provide Hong Kong banks uh, a maximum of renminbi 10 billion um, in a single day. Secondly, the Hong Kong MA will designate some banks as primary liquidity providers so they can set prices more actively in the market and would uh, be more active in promoting renminbi business. Now I'd like to talk about the investment performance of the exchange fund. As Mr. Chen said, in the international market, uh, given the monetary environment there, um, which is very complex, we can still see strong volatility in the market, especially in the third quarter. There is strong volatility in the foreign currency market. Let us look at this chart. If you look at the second column from the left, that's our quarter, uh, third quarter investment performance. Hong Kong equities 
we have a small um, deficit of $200 million. And other equities, we have got $2.8 billion income, bonds, and also some income. But then in terms of foreign exchange, we have a deficit of $28.4 billion. This is because in quarter three, non-U.S. currencies have devalued, uh, given uh, euro, uh, where there is a weak economy, and also the ECB announced their credit easing in September. Uh, there will be a lowering of interest rate and also buying of bonds in the market. So the euro has dropped 7.7 percent against the U.S. dollar. It has dropped from 1.73 to 1.2. The same goes for the Japanese yen. In April, they raised the sales tax, and uh, the, in quarter three, the economy is somewhat sluggish, and uh, the market is guessing whether there will be more QE, and uh, in fact, it happened last week. So it dropped 7.6% against the U.S. dollar from 101 to almost 110 at the end of the quarter. The pound also dropped by 5% in the same period. You will remember there was the Scottish referendum, and there was pressure uh, borne by the pound. So all in all, in quarter three, we have uh, suffered a, depart a deficit from investment to the tune of uh, $18.7 billion. But if you look at the three quarters as a whole, please look at the leftist column. We have got $37.7 billion income from investment of the exchange fund. And here let us look at the middle, and that is a payment to fiscal reserves. In quarter three, we have already agreed on it, and in 2014, we would use the interest rate of 3.6 percent, and therefore, we have paid $6.7 billion into the fiscal reserves. And from Japan, January to September, we have already paid $20.6 billion into the fiscal reserves. Thank you. I think I'll stop here. Thank you very much, Mr. Chen and your team. Now it's time for members to ask questions. And eight members have raised their hands. The order is Wang Kok Heng, Chen Kam Lam, Regina Ip, Starry Lee, Teng Ka Pyu, Ng Leung Singh, Ronnie Tong, and Sin Chung Kai. Anyone else? I'll give four minutes to each member, including the reply. Mr. Wang Kwok-Hing, thank you, Chairman. I'd like to ask Mr. Norman Chan. The Hong Kong economic and political um, situations are both affected by uh, external and internal forces. Externally, the three main economies are still seeing a lot of uncertainties. They are still printing notes. And internally, there is illegal occupation of the roads. So our core values and also the basis of the rule of law have been seriously damaged. Even the Bar Association has said that the uh, core value of rule of the law is at risk. This does not hurt Hong Kong only. The Hong Kong economy may already be hovering around a watershed. Mr. Chen, just now you said that in October, it seems that superficially uh, we still see stability. But the Hong Kong-Shanghai Stock Connect is held up now. We don't know when it will be implemented. And in the hotel catering and retail sectors, they should be entering a pre-Christmas peak period, but they are affected by a lot of uncertainties. Our sovereign rating is now quite worrying. We see that the banking sector and even the Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank has proposed we should rather use renminbi in Hong Kong. So, Mr. Norman Chan, how do you assess Hong Kong's economy in the near future? How can we resolve the problem given uh, the internal damage done? And also, it is said that with the Stock Connect, 
Hong Kong people can exchange for more than 20,000 RMB every day. Uh, when can that relaxation happen? Do you have a roadmap and timetable for it? Mr. Chen, thank you. Mr. Wong, you have asked a series of questions. Let me talk about the eco economic situation. I said that worldwide, the future is not certain, but after the mainland economy has slowed down in growth, it's still recording a growth rate of 7%. In fact, that is remarkable given the present environment. The mainland economic scale is not like before, and uh, it is at 9,000 billion US dollars. So if it is uh, a growth of 7% is already very remarkable. and. I think that will be some kind of support and impetus for the Hong Kong economy. Mr. Wong mentioned different aspects. In my introduction, I said that until this moment, there is still uh, not any seen impact done on the financial market. And I said that, of course, the occupation is unlawful. Many overseas investors are watching the situation. Uh, they want to know for how long it will go on. You may understand that social stability and financial stability must be premised on the rule of law. If the rule of law is um, continuously damaged, social stability, of course, may be affected, but then there will also be a blow done to financial stability. And in fact, the credit rating agencies have written articles to say that uh, it depends on how the situation will evolve. And if this goes on without resolution, then Hong Kong's rating may be affected. What about the daily exchange of 20,000 RMB? Uh, we don't have um, any news on this one. Mr. Chen Kem Lam, Chairman, if uh, there are too many political activities in a place, if there are more political activities than financial activities in a place, there will be political crisis and social instability. In other countries, their investors have the feeling that the rule of law in Hong Kong is at risk. And therefore, there has been a blow done to our investment, investment environment. Looking from the graphs and figures shown us by the CEO today, we can see that the property market has not adjusted downwards or stabilized uh, despite the few tough measures. In fact, it's still going up. Plus, given the household debt situation, which is still serious and, and which is actually still climbing, I think I can see a bubble risk and if household debts are also going up, it may give people the feeling that there is instability. If in case there will be an increase in interest rate internationally, I'm afraid Hong Kong will face a severe financial situation, including the appearance of negative equities. Now, whether the bubble will burst any time soon is difficult to say. Mr. Chan, let's ask you what the Hong Kong MA can do to ensure that if indeed that risk will appear in uh, the next period, what kind of measures can we take? Mr. Chan, thank you. Mr. Chen Kem Lam. I think you made a very valid point, and that is the macro environment is uncertain and it is also unstable. Hong Kong is an externally oriented economy, and uh, undoubtedly we will be uh, affected by the capital flow and other kinds of volatilities. Mr. Chen is asking us how we can gear up for that situation. Well, facing with this very macro unstable situation, uh, we should not act just now because it would have been too late. Let us talk about household debts. Actually, in October 2009, we already were getting prepared because when QE was introduced in the U.S., we 
could see that uh, a lot of capital will be flowing to Hong Kong, and there will be the chasing of uh, assets, including property. And there was a strong um, upward movement, and therefore we started the first stage of counter cyclical measures. And in June last year, we started the second stage of cycle counter cyclical measures. Mr. Chen, you said that the property prices have not stabilized, but I don't think we can look at it that way. We have to ask uh, how the property market would have been without those measures. Hong Kong households who have taken out a mortgage are much better prepared for such risks than in the last century. Uh, Mr. Chen was saying if there will be the cycle of interest rate increase, what will happen? Now, in fact, when we um, dish out mortgages, we have already asked banks to do stress tests for the borrowers. We said that if the interest rate will go up by 2%, we will still want to know whether the borrowers would have difficulty repaying the loan. And then we actually increase it to 3%. And all borrowers will be subject to such stress tests. We have to make sure that they have the ability to repay before loans are um, given by banks. As I said, uh, private loans are increasing faster, and therefore in January this year, we have asked banks to be more prudent and uh, assess the borrower's ability to repay first. This is Regina Yip. Thank you, Chairman. I have three questions for Mr. Chen and his team. First of all, Mr. Chen told us a lot about the monetary policy in the U.S. and the performance of the U.S. economy. Of course, the U.S has a lot of influence on Hong Kong. What about the mainland? I mean, the Chinese economy is slowing down, and they want to break, <coughs> break, break, break down the so-called middle-income trap. Would there be a soft landing, how, and how would that impact Hong Kong? Secondly, Islamic finance. The Hong Kong MA told us that they have successfully issued $1 billion worth of the sukkul. I understand that in Asia, the Islamic Financial Centre is in Kuala Lumpur. How do we compare with uh, uh, Kuala Lumpur and how can we catch up? And thirdly, regarding the investment performance of the HAMA and uh, looking at the figures, I think the high, highest growth comes from other investments which perform best. So what exactly are those investments? Would you increase the proportion of such investments? <laughs> three questions. Mr. Chen, I hope you will you know, cover all those three questions. I already said that the the U.S. economy is not uh, doing too badly. They are seeing a 2.5 percent growth. I mean, they coming out of the crisis. I think uh, the, 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 the the rebound is not particularly strong. But in, in the case of China, I think the possibility of uh, soft landing is is very high. Uh, given that the many economy uh, are facing so many problems, they need to reform the financial market and also open up the capital account. So there are many problems that they need to deal with. Overall speaking, since we have a close link, uh, financial and economic links with the mainland, I think that in the long term, uh, I mean China will become the 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 the, 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 the uh, pillar of support for the Hong Kong economy. Regarding Islamic finance, uh, I think Dubai, Kuala Lumpur, and London have been actively developing Islamic finance. I think the prospect for such, this product is very good. Hong Kong is only making a start now, and we understand that we have many. We we do not compare with the other Islamic financial centers like Kuala Lumpur in in several respects. So we would first therefore we therefore decided to issue first for a sovereign bond, and so that we can work together with Dubai and Kuala Lumpur. Islamic finance has a lot of room for for development in the Islamic world. I mean, the Islamic world has existed for a long time. But the, the the history of Islamic finance is very short, so there's no question of our competing with Kuala Lumpur. Uh, they are the leader, so we will explore how we can work with them together so in order to develop this market. Regarding our investments, Mrs. Yip uh, knows that uh, over the last few years we have uh, diversified our investments and the uh, items of investments. Uh, 
I mean, uh, are different from the bonds that we buy from uh, developed countries. We've uh, invested into uh, uh, private equity funds and so on. Well, regarding the uh, source of revenue uh, f for the other investments, basically they come from equi private equity funds and investments in properties. Our target is that they will make up about one third of our cumulative reserves. As at the end of last year, we have already invested uh, roughly $90 billion. Going forward, we will steadily increase such investments in order to, to capture a, a better return for the medium and long term. Starry Lee. Chairman, I'd like to follow up on the <clears throat> effectiveness of the counter-cyclical measures. Uh, the government had launched three such measures uh, extend, uh, in order to cool the property market. As Ms. Norman Chen told us, the property market during this period has been increasing, be it the, volume, the, num the, the, the turnover and the prices. And people are asking whether or not these draconian measures are no longer effective and that, or that they're not draconian enough. Or is it that because of the QE, uh, which is now easing, uh, but uh, but uh, but uh, they have the, 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 but uh, but despite that, you know the the, the uh, uh, liquid capital all over the world are still coming to the property market in Hong Kong, or is because is it because Hong Kong people have a lot of savings and they are uh, still buying? So I like to ask Mr. Chen where. Uh, do the turnovers uh, come from? Who are the purchasers? Are they the investors or the, the genuine users? Secondly, the Occupy Central movement is still going on. We, we don't see, we don't know when it will end. Financial stability is the cornerstone of our social stability. So I'd like to ask Mr. Chen, what, the HA, what, what contingencies does the HAMA have? And do you think what would be the worst case scenario in terms of the Occupy Central movement affecting our economy? Two questions, Mr. Chen. Thank you, Ms. Lee. Let me answer your second question first. In fact, HAMA's uh, duty and uh, the work that we've been doing over the years is that through the su supervising banks, we will maintain the stability of our banking system and our financial system. We firmly believe that the stability of society or its prosperity and stability is premised on its financial stability. We haven't seen an example where in a country or jurisdiction where uh, financial instability, uh, instability will result in social stability. Uh, so Ms. Lee asked what, what would happen if the situation is the other way around. I think financial stability is the basis for social stability. What we want to achieve is uh, financial stability. We all know that the financial market so far has responded moderately to the Occupy Central movement. That is because we've done a lot of good uh, work over in the past. But if the uh, movement continues, and uh, uh, the biggest problem is that the Occupy Central movement is actually unlawful and it's against the spirit of the rule of law. And in turn, it will affect our financial stability. Uh, even though we have a good foundation for our financial system, it may be affected by the social instability. So many investors and rating agencies are now looking at uh, I mean, this movement, which has lasted for more than 30 days already, and going forward, how long will it last, and how we can, how we will end, and that is a very important subject. Your second question is about the QE and our counter cyclical measures. The two are actually, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, opposite to each other. The counter cyclical measures that we have adopted had increased the cost of buying property or and also curb demand. But uh, because of sufficient liquidity and QE, it, it actually increased demand. So it's not the case that, uh, that our measures are not working. But rather, without these counter-cyclical measures, one should ask, what would the property market be like? Very soon, or, or rather for a long period of time, 
According to the vice chairman of the FOMC, he said that within two months to a year, the U.S. will probably increase the interest rates. The interest rate rise is an important factor which affects our capital market in Hong Kong. Let us not forget that if either the Fed will not increase the, 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 the interest rate, if it de decides to do that, they will not do it for just one round. They will tend to typically increase interest rate in, by, in, second, in several rounds, and that would in turn affect our liquidity and also the prices in our, in our, in our, in our uh, capital market. Mr. Tan Kapil. Chair, um, Chairman, I want to ask a question regarding the link exchange trade and monetary policy. Recently, some media and some bankers uh, have raised this question, which concerns not only the banks but the general public. Before the handover, we had this uh, pack exchange rate, which gave us the stability uh, and a prospect. But from 2009, on which the U.S. dollar has depreciated by 30 percent. So the employees are finding that they are, that, that they are losing the purchasing power and, and also uh, prices in the mainland is, is going up. And so they are suffering both ways. I think it's about time. For people who are paid with Hong Kong dollars, the purchasing power has dropped by 30 percent. At the same time, by the same logic rather, uh, when the U.S. dollar depreciates, then the value of a foreign exchange reserve would also shrink, although it's, it's denominated in U.S. dollars. So faced with rising property prices, and we cannot, uh, you know, adjust our own interest rates, and employees are now having such a tough time. When are you going to make that change? This is a sensitive issue, but I think, uh, 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 but this is also uh, the concern of the majority of the people. So you say that uh, the Europe is now also adopting credit easing. So can we rely on the mainland uh, as the uh, basis of our uh, to guide our monetary policy? Well, the, the link exchange rate is the cornerstone of our entire financial system. Mr. Tang talk about the impact on the welfare of Hong Kong. Well, currency and financial stability is actually the foundation of our social uh, stability. You cannot assume that after the link exchange rate is abolished, our social st stability can still be maintained. You look at some other jurisdictions, their exchange rates tend to fluctuate uh, 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 very much, and as a result, you have you know the drastic uh, 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 inflow and outflow of capitals in. Uh, on property prices, given the imbalance between supply and demand, I think we all accept that this is the main reason for the overheated property market. I don't think any change in the exchange rate would have any impact on the, on the, on the increase in the supply of land. On inflation, when the U.S. massively adopted its QE policy, it, the, the value of its currency would weaken. And for the emerging economies, including RMB, uh, uh, they would uh, uh, go up. But we now see that the U.S. is adopting, uh, is starting, uh, is tapering. They will stop buying bonds, and they will probably start buying uh, increasing rates next year. So, in other words, uh, and now the U.S. dollar is now appreciating vis-à-vis -vis the other currencies. We tend to look at the long term rather than the short-term activities. If the U.S. dollar should uh, strengthen and the Hong Kong dollar is packed to the U.S. dollar, doesn't that mean that our purchasing, purchasing power of the Hong Kong dollar will also increase? Uh, assuming that the Hong Kong dollar is all, will always stay weak compared with other currencies like RMB, that is not compatible with the, uh, the, 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 the theory of uh, business cycles. We will continuously review the situation. And the conclusion of that review is that the link exchange rate is the best system that suits Hong Kong, which has uh, an entirely open economy. Jeffrey Lam. Uh, the CE told us just now that the U.S. will start buying bonds. But when will interest rates go up? Some people are saying that it, this may not happen too soon. But then we cannot simply uh, do nothing about it. If the interest rate should go up, 
and it will have an impact on the business community and the property market. How much of an impact do you think there will be according to your estimate? Although you may you said that it may not happen too soon, but how soon do you expect it, this will happen? Is it going to be the second quarter, first quarter, or second quarter of next year? Thank you, Mr. Lam. For the U.S. to increase its uh, interest rate and the timetable for doing that is still not very certain. The market now uh, tend to ag uh, 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 agree that the interest rate will probably uh, take place in the middle of next year. In the chart, I, I gave you a prediction of the interest rate, when, uh, which will be higher than uh, than now. There's no nobody is saying that the interest rate will not go up next year. Mr. Lam is saying that this may happen earlier. Some economists. Uh, look at the uh, labor participation rate, which has stayed at the, the lowest level uh, in the last 35 years. So even though uh, the number of they're not creating uh, new jobs very quickly, but the drop in the unemployment rate is very, uh, very uh, rapid. This is because the labor participation rate is falling, and if this continues, then the unemployment rate will fall, and it will also create pressure for wages to go up, and this may possibly result in a higher rate of inflation in the U.S. than they anticipate. And there is more complexity now. The U.S. currency has gone up uh, as against the euro and other currencies, but then commodities prices, including oil prices, have gone down, and this would uh, help uh, imported inflation in the U.S. So the situation is complex. How should Hong Kong get prepared for enterprises? In the past two, three years, uh, they have issued bonds, and the bond yields are comparatively low. They have adequate capital, and so at a time when the interest is low, they have got some capital, and therefore, the overall capital cost will not be too high when the interest rate goes up. As for individuals, I can see that the household debt ratio as against GDP, uh, that is at 63 percent, and I can say it is very high. And we can take measures about property buying so people will really know um, that they should cut their clothes according to the cloth, that they should be ensured about their ability to repay first. And we have done something about private loans this year uh, that we are asking banks to be prudent in giving out loans so that well, later when the interest rate goes up, uh, I don't want people to have liquidity problems. Chairman, Occupy Central, there is not a lot of impact on our overall operation, but the message is important. What will Hong Kong MA do to allow the other countries to understand the actual situation in Hong Kong and advise those who are staying there to wait and see? Uh, there may be people holding up their investments. What can you do? Mr. Chen, can you give a brief response? Well, yes, we have never stopped promoting Hong Kong as an international financial hub. I was in Paris last week. Uh, I was doing a road show to promote Hong Kong as a RMB business platform. And those investors who may have interest in Hong Kong, we would always liaise with them. But then there is one thing that we cannot easily explain. They ask, when will the Occupy movement end, and how will it end? And whether there will be any long-term impact on Hong Kong's social, political, and financial environment. Now, those questions cannot be easily answered. I can only say that such unlawful acts should end as soon as possible. They have to end before I can give a clear answer to overseas investors and tell them that, in fact, Hong Kong's competitiveness is still strong. Mr. Ronnie Tong, Chairman, Mr. Norman Chan is only assessing the Occupy movement as it is happening. I am disappointed. I think the Hong Kong MA should look farther and wider. The Occupy movement is only part of the problem. If we do not resolve this gridlock, 
created by the constitutional development, even if the Occupy movement will end tomorrow, we will still face social instability and also instability in the operation of the LegCo, so that in the end there will be unstable government policies. This is a long-term issue. It is not just for the short term. My question for Mr. Chen is, have you done long-term research and assessment on this gridlock created by the constitutional development? If it is not resolved, what will happen in the next three to five or even ten years? How will that affect our credit rating and also our status as a financial center? Have you done that kind of research? If not, why not? Mr. Chen, the jurisdiction of the Hong Kong MA and also as the CEO, uh, I should not be commenting on political issues. Mr. Ronnie Tong asked how um, overseas investors, especially institutional investors, view Hong Kong. They will look at Hong Kong's overall business environment, Hong Kong's competitiveness, and if they come to Hong Kong, uh, whether there will be benefit for them in the medium term and long term. Very often they would look for figures, but then they would also look at certain factors, one of which must be the rule of law. And I'm sure Mr. Ronnie Tong will agree that without the rule of law, society cannot forever remain stable. As for the political systems, uh, the design and evolution of such systems, uh, Chairman, sorry, I have in limited time. I'm not asking you to respond to political issues as an individual. Neither am I asking you how o overseas investors are assessing the Hong Kong political situation. My question is whether you have done a long-term research into the quandary or quagmire created by the constitutional crisis and how that would affect Hong Kong's uh, financial center status and also our credit rating. If you have not done it, why not? And when will you do it? Mr. Chen, this will be difficult because you talked about a political gridlock. I don't know how you can define it. Well, you must look at the worst scenario because you can see that the Chinese um, authorities are adopting a very um, adamant stance, uh, and so are the protesters. We don't know whether the crisis will be resolved soon. On the contrary, even if the Occupy movement will end tomorrow, that um, difficult situation can span over a few years. As I said, there will be social instability, legal instability, and even government policy instability. Don't you uh, or shouldn't you research into that? I think, Mr. Tong, uh, your question is very clear. I would give time for Mr. Chan to respond. Uh, Mr. Tong, I think um, it is very difficult because we must uh, monitor or supervise the financial system. Just now, you were asking this question, and that is how the political gridlock will affect our financial situation. That is very difficult, and it is not within um, our jurisdiction. We'll have to go back and see whether we are competent in doing that kind of research. I don't understand why you say it is difficult, because I'm talking about whether there will be any impact on our financial status hub and also the credit rating. No, Mr. Tong, you were talking about the impact of the political gridlock. I think we have to define that clearly first. Mr. Sin, well, he, he won't be able to answer this. I will ask a technical question about slide number 23. Can we go to page 23? Raymond B. Settleman. I hope my understanding is correct. The mainland chose a few places to do Raymond B. Settleman. I think apart from Hong Kong, we have other places. I stand to be corrected. If there are other places doing RMB settlement, what about their transaction figures? On the figure on the right, uh, slide 23, please. Payments from Hong Kong to mainland, payments from mainland to Hong Kong. From mainland to Hong Kong, uh, in the last two years, that far exceeded the payments from Hong Kong to mainland. What does this mean? Does it mean that a lot of B has flowed into Hong Kong from the mainland? I can see the deposit figure has jumped quite a bit. What does it tell us? Another question. Uh, 
Another slide about Europe. Slide number three, the ECB balance sheet. It is about、um, credit easing. I understand for the U.S. it jumped from six percent to twenty-five percent. That I understand, and you explained very clearly just now that, in fact,、uh, credit easing or QE started with Japan. But why has there been a drop in Europe? My, I thought that、uh, two, three years ago there was still a big crisis of the euro debt. Why is it that it has come down by over ten percent? I will try to answer these questions. The in 2011, the ECB wrote out LTR. It doesn't talk about QE because FED would buy debts, and then it created the money in order to pack it to. The bank account, but then for the ECB, it actually lends out money to the banks, which have to repay the loans, and of course at a very favorable、um, interest rate. And therefore, when it has a, a, had a lot of money to lend out, so it took out 33 percent of the GDP. But then the banks gradually repaid the ECB, and now it is starting a new round of debt buying. And it has also got this、uh, fixed orientation, long, t-、uh, long term、uh, financing, and I believe that will again push up the rate of the、um, credit rating according to、um, or credit easing on the basis of the、um, GDP.、Uh, talking about RMB settlements, sometimes the settlements are done through Hong Kong, if.、Uh, It happens more in Hong Kong than it might settle in Hong Kong. It may、um, precipitate in Hong Kong, and that may be the source for RMB deposit in Hong Kong. And if it is done in the reverse manner, then there will be a shrinking of such deposits. But you can see that、uh, there are a lot of financing activities in Hong Kong. Say banks will lend money to en- enterprises for investing in the mainland, so the mainland goes to the mainland. But then there are many mainland.、Um, Agencies, including the Ministry of Finance, coming to issue bonds in Hong Kong, and then later on, the money、uh, upon maturity will go back to the mainland, and so it is very interactive. So the answer is, if、uh, the payments from the mainland to Hong Kong will always be more than payments from Hong Kong to the mainland, then that would represent a main source of、uh, funding for Hong Kong. Mr. Albert Ho, Mr. Chen just said that the Hong Kong MA wouldn't like to be involved in political assessment or commentary. But Mr. Chen, you said that the Occupy movement will affect the rule of law and therefore financial instability. I think that is in a just what you said, and you did not address the political factors mentioned by Mr. Ronnie Tong. So I think、uh, this is biased and very superficial. In, in fact, that is already some kind of political analysis. Even if you don't want to make a political comment, Mr. Chen, just now you said it in a very simplistic, simplistic way. You are saying、uh, this is Occupy Central, and so it affects rule of law and therefore financial instability. I think、uh, this is very simplistic and superficial because you have not mentioned the very important factors, and that is the Occupy movement has said very clearly that it doesn't seek to challenge certain laws or not even the legal system, and the occupiers have said very clearly that while they are peaceful and non-violent, they are willing to subject themselves to legal sanction. So they are challenging the overall system, the unfairness in the overall system. And it is not just this one. There may be、um, other social conflicts that may surface. You will see that、um, society is very polarized, and young people are very unhappy with the existing systems. And also, there is deterioration between the uh, uh, in the relationship between the executive and the legislature. These are all very important factors. So, Mr. Chen, if you are explaining the situation to other people out of Hong Kong, don't just talk about rule of law. I think it's not going to be difficult to clear the sites, but then I don't know whether there will be an other movement because、uh, these social conflicts that we are seeing cannot possibly be resolved by the present system. And as you said, Mr. Chen, 
This must be resolved in a political way. It is not going to be resolved by any research done by the Hong Kong MA. But this is not just an issue of the rule of law, Mr. Chen. My question for you is, there are many uncertain factors, but still, there has not been um, any impact yet done on Hong Kong. But of course, we should be concerned about the long term. In uh, Mr. Sin Chung Kai just now asked a question, and we could see a lot of money flowing in. Where has the money gone? Is it that basically it has gone towards speculation on property? The tough measures should be able to suppress speculation activities. So are you watching where the capital inflow uh, has been directed? Uh, the, there has not been any net inflow or outflow of capital recently. This, the, the trend has been rather stable. Of course, when capital flows into Hong Kong, they can be used for different purposes. Some could be used for business or investment or the setting up of companies or some of the <clears throat> uh, capital may be used to buy property or stocks. Overall speaking, after the, the capital is flown into Hong Kong and converted into Hong Kong dollar, they will go into our banking system. Uh, the 100 billion U.S. dollars, uh, I mean, since, since uh, the full, uh, fourth quarter of 2008, they have not really left Hong Kong yet. When will they leave? Uh, and they will leave when the U.S. you know starts a, a cycle of uh, rising interest rate, and when interest rates are in the U.S. is higher than that of Hong Kong, then because of the <coughs> the, the the interest rate uh, uh, spread, uh, the such uh, capital will, will will gradually move out of Hong Kong. You're right. Well, the, the, when the capital comes into Hong Kong, they will come to buy uh, assets, and when uh, when there's a seller. When the uh, seller, you know, buys the asset and receives Hong Kong dollars, he will not convert it into a foreign currency, would put it into the dollar banking system instead. So this is not something that would uh, 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 continue indefinitely. Uh, Mr. Lung Singh, I would like to ask a question regarding the uh, investment income. Uh, from for the first three quarters and uh, third quarter, you have uh, incurred a loss of more than twenty billion U.S. dollars. So for the so are you? Does it mean that you uh, gradually you will be changing the the the, the uh, portfolio? Are you going to review the 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 the, the uh, composition of your foreign exchange portfolio? And Everybody is concerned about the Occupy Central movement. I think we are seeing uh, the phenomenon now, but I think the, the, the implications would be much more far-reaching. Some colleagues said that uh, the protesters are willing to be sanctioned by the law, but then uh, Hong, the Ho Hong Kong may have to may, may suffer because of that. The law enforcement authorities have not of been able to effectively enforce the law for more than 30 days, and more than one and a half million dollars have put down their signatures asking the uh, law enforcement agencies to enforce, uh, take enforcement action. Uh, sec the second question is about uh, you know uh, you know uh, compliance of the law, and this is something for the future. The, I think we should accept whatever uh, monetary policies and policies that, that, that Beijing uh, offer Hong Kong, but then we are ignoring uh, the decision of the of the uh, MPCSC. So does that mean that the various provinces in China uh, will continue to be willing to give all these favorable concessions to Hong Kong, even if our agreements have been signed and if we do not abide by the MPC, the, 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 the rule of the spirit of the rule of law of the MPCSC, then how can they continue to honor the favor economic concessions that they have promised Hong Kong? And that's the 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 the, the, the co consequence that we have to face going forward. So, shouldn't the HAMA adopt certain, you know, measures to manage expectation? Uh, is it really the case that all these uh, mainland policies policies can be implemented so smoothly? 
Well, the APEC summit uh, has now uh, been moved to Beijing, and if the summit were indeed to be held in Hong Kong, I don't really know how we could do it. So perhaps we can adopt some remedial measures and invite the financial ministers in future to to show them that Hong Kong is really a peaceful place and that we are able to resolve our our, our differences so that our economy uh, could you know really improve we can ask the financial ministers to come to Hong Kong for a visit and conduct informal meetings here that I think will benefit Hong Kong rather than several tens of thousands of people giving themselves up at to, to uh, at the police station Mr. Chan I don't have very much time let me talk about the meeting of financial ministers the HAM a belongs to the organization of central banks. Uh, we rarely would uh, invite the financial ministers uh, directly, but very, some, from time to time we will be hosting such m meetings of financial ministers. Just because something has happened in Hong Kong, we will not give up, uh, you know, the the opportunity to invite, uh, uh, you know, financial ministers to come to Hong Kong for meetings of central bankers. Uh, so I hope that when when you look at our income, uh, our, our revenue, and our, uh, our, our, our investment returns, um, uh, Mr. Ng asked whether or not we will change our portfolio. Right now, the U.S. dollar take up seventy three percent, other currencies twenty seven percent. Every year, we will conduct a review of our benchmark, Mr. Chen Wafeng. The Occupy Central movement has lasted for some time already, and the currency market has remained rather stable. Our exchange rate has has remained very steady, but then the impact on the financial market is uh, slowly surfacing. Mr. Peter Wong of the Hong Kong Shanghai Bank pointed out last Friday that local banks are losing some of the customers and people who intended to invest in Hong Kong or to, to, to issue no uh, uh, stocks or to or bonds uh, 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 are having cold feet. So I'd like to ask whether the HMA has any measures. Uh, I mean, tell us what would be the case, worst case scenario. Do you have any contingencies uh, in place in order that our, our, our position at the, as a financial center will not be uh, shaken? Uh, Mr. Chen, you're a financial expert. Have you considered going to the protest area and explain to the students that because of the illegal occupation and breaking the law, uh, they are deterring, you know, invest investors coming to Hong Kong, and eventually they will be the one who will suffer. History in future will will condemn them. Let me answer your second question first. We don't have such intention or plan yet. To answer your first question, Hong Kong being Hong Kong status as an international financial center. Within this region, Hong Kong is not the only center. Many customers, many investors have a choice. So, so we have a competitive environment among the financial centers. Another uh, deep rooted problem is the stability of the financial system. I mean, the financial system could be stable or not stable. You don't need to be a financial center. On the question of competitiveness, we said just now that. The banks, bankers, you know, have close connection with their customers, and we, they told us that some of the deals have been uh, slowed down. Recently, we've talked to the bankers and asked them about the observation, but it's still too early. Many of them are adopting a wait and see attitude, and some bankers told us that the uh, private wealth management uh, business. Uh, there have been customers who want to transfer the Hong Kong assets overseas. For these high-end customers, uh, they can choose not only to uh, put the assets in Hong Kong, they can consider moving the assets to Switzerland or Europe or Singapore. But these are only inquiries so far, and we, we are told that they have not received too many such requests. And they told us that 
it really depends on how long the protests will, will go on and under what circumstances will the movement end. And that is really uh, the major concern. If we could have a, find a peaceful resolution and if we could resolve the, 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 pro the issue by way of a dialogue, even though we are not able to resolve all the uh, problems, but at least at the moment people, people are most concerned about the streets being occupied, the major thoroughfares being occupied, and if that could end, then financial offices, financial institutions, and investors will see this as a, as a positive development. I note that later on, you, you will, t together with uh, the Secretary for Financial Services and Treasury, visit Beijing. Could you uh, clarify with them uh, the issue relating to Hong Kong's position as a financial center, and also uh, ask them when the Shanghai Hong Kong Stock Connect will 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 be implemented. Well, in fact, I will be going to Beijing with the secretary, and I certainly talk to the officials when I meet with them this uh, in Beijing. Well, we've already finished the first round, and we have Mr. Chen Kam Long and Star Lee uh, going for the second round. Anyone else, Mr. Long Singh? So. Uh, so I'll draw a line there because we need to end our discussion for this item at half past eleven. So I'm going to give three minutes to each member. Chen Kam Lam, our status as a financial center depends on the rule of law. Uh, over the last few decades, we have evolved from a tiny fishing village to an international financial center. Uh, a harmonious society, a stable society where there is rule of law is the most important. And it has nothing to do with the political system. It, in the past and now, even the political reform that we are talking about, if they could not be uh, 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 approved, it does not conflict with the our uh, economic development. So even if we have a very democratic system, that doesn't mean that we will become a financial international financial center. If you take a look at the Philippines, Bangkok, will they become international financial centers? They have, you know, a popular election, but it doesn't work for them. So our social stability in Hong Kong, I think the biggest problem now is that we have political activists, people who want to uh, you know, assume power and become the chief executive, are now causing disruption in our society. And that's where, where the crisis is. Uh, the protesters are willing to be subject to the sanction of the law. Now, if you've broken the egg and you say you're willing to, to accept the consequence, that doesn't work. Recently, uh, the U.S. and Canada have fanatics you know, holding guns and shooting down students at schools, and many people have been killed. Uh, I mean, if the murderer say, I will accept the sanctions of the law, that wouldn't help because the damage has been done. Uh, even if you accept the sanctions of the law, it's going, not going to remedy the, 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 the problem. That is not rule of law. I think in Hong Kong, our rule of law is being, being uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, tarnished. And the overseas investors are now very worried about what is happening here in Hong Kong. A few days ago, Mr. Peter Wong expressed his concern, and this really reflects uh, what is happening in our society. Uh, our rule of law is now being challenged. Some people are uh, not only, uh, you know, political fanatics. Uh, the problem also, you know, uh, happens in this council. There are even legal practitioners who condone, uh, you know, uh, such uh, activities, and they are inciting these people to continue to occupy the roads, and illegal activities are taking place every day, and this is indeed worrying. Starry. 
the Occupy Central movement eventually will end one day, and I think we should have an early discussion on the uh, Im impact after the movement ends. I'm sure uh, the relationship between Hong Kong and, and China will become more tense uh, and a very weak uh, mutual uh, trust that we have built up uh, may likely break down. The financial sector has already told us that the, some of the impacts are already apparent. For example, the APEC uh, summit has been moved to Beijing. The Shanghai Hong Kong Stock Connect has been postponed indefinitely. And those are very strong signals. Mr. Chen, according to your contact with the mainland officials, have you noticed that uh, what have you have you, what do you think is the, res the response of the mainland officials uh, uh, to the Occupy Central movement? I have seen from the internet that uh, some people are saying Hong Kong is like a spoiled child. I am really worried about our future liaison and discussion with mainland officials on financial matters. Mr. Chen, thank you. Ms. Lee. Ms. Lee mentioned Stock Connect. I say something on this. Uh, certainly. The FST Bureau and the SFC and also the Chinese Commission on uh, stock supervision would be the main players. But uh, we also have a role to play in terms of the capital flow. We have taken measures that uh, hopefully after Stock Connect is implemented, if there will be a larger transaction on equities, uh, we'd like to do more about um, liquidity and management of the banks. We are still discussing, but we are almost ready. And in the process, I have not heard that uh, because of the Occupy movement, we need to delay uh, the policies that we have already decided on. What about the future? future discussion on policies. What is your assessment? Will there be an impact? Hong Kong has to continue to be an international financial center. We might like to secure appropriate policies from the Ministry of Finance in order to secure mutually beneficial policies. Mr. Chen, well, of course, they are uh, watching the developments in Hong Kong. But uh, still, um, the movement has taken place for over 30 days. Uh, when will it end? Will it go on for a very long time? Or will it end soon? And uh, how will it end? Will it end through dialogue and in a peaceful way? The different scenarios may have a different impact on people's psychology. So it's very difficult for me to do an assessment now. Mr. Ng Liang Singh, on page 9, this is about uh, risk in the property market. The last term of government it did not do a lot about housing production, including um, HOS production. Next year, we are looking at the production of 74,000 units. I'd like to ask about changes in the property market. When do you expect the downward cycle to start? So you might have to now assess the number of negative equities that may surface and how are you going to control loans issued by banks. I'm saying this because, as you said, Mr. Chen, inward investment is not just about cash. People will come to Hong Kong to buy quality property, but if this will slow down, and recently there is uh, also a strong desire to sell. And if that's the case, there will be a smaller desire to buy. If that is happening, shouldn't you uh, do more by way of risk management, Mr. Chen? Actually, the Hong Kong property market has engaged in an upward cycle 
for very long. Now, when will it take a turn in the opposite direction? I think that's complicated, and we need to wait and see. I would say that、um, the U.S. has stopped its QE measures. And interest rates have not gone up yet, but when it really starts to increase interest, then there will be a big impact on the Hong Kong property market. Mr. Ng asked about the possibility of neg negative equities and what we are going to do. I think the only preparation we can do is to start with a property buyer going for a mortgage loan. And we are going to preserve the ratio at seventy percent, a loan-to-value ratio、uh, for small and medium-sized properties. But、uh, for larger properties, people might have to pay fifty percent of the value as down payment. And、uh, would there be、uh, as many negative equities as the last time when the bubble burst? I think、uh, the situation will not be as bad. In the last time, the、uh, Down payment was thirty、uh, percent, but now people cannot have a loan to value ratio of seventy percent for many properties. So there is a leeway for property prices to fall. So、uh, the the risk、uh, of negative equity is comparatively lower this time. Mr. Wang Tingkuang would like to speak for the first time. After Mr. Wang Tingkuang has asked his questions, we will end our discussion of this item. Four minutes for you, Mr. Wang. Thank you. Recently, we have the Occupy Central movement. Some media, especially, especially internet media, have rumored that some Occupy activists are short selling. Futures. They are trying to reap a big profit in the financial market while starting a big political movement.、Uh, is the Hong Kong MA aware of this? Would this、um, amount to market making? Or speculation.、Uh, would any illegal acts have been committed, Mr. Chen? Can are you aware of this, and what is your view, Mr. Chen? Thank you, Mr. Wong. In my introduction, I said that、uh, we are watching the equity market, but we are not the frontline supervisor.、Uh, they are SFC and also the Hong Kong X. We are in constant. Dialogue with them. In 1997, 1998, there were sharks、uh, short selling、um, Hong Kong stocks and futures, but、uh, they might not do the same thing every time to attack the Hong Kong markets. But、uh, we, we are keeping a close watch. Talking about equities, we will look at the open futures interest. In other words,、um, whether there will be big changes, if a big account would want to short sell futures by a large margin, then、uh, there will be a lot of transactions, and also there will be an increase in、uh, positions not squared. But、uh, as I said, we don't see any changes at all before and after the movement. And as for equities, the Uh, index fell, but、uh, recently it has picked up, and in fact, right now as it stands, it is a little higher than that on the 26th or 28th of September. But we will be keeping watch, and another、uh, monitoring factor is whether there is any change to high ball. In 1998, when the sharks attacked the Hong Kong market, they borrowed. So much Hong Kong dollars, and then、uh, sold it, so that、um, it could attack the currency peg and make a profit. But now we see very good capital adequacy ratio at the banks, and then the high ball has not exhibited a lot of changes. So we have not seen、um, people、um, making market, making the market in order to reap a profit. No follow up, right, Mr. Wang? In other words, Mr. Chan. Um, the internet and also the media 
have、uh, rumored this, and it is your view that there is nothing of this sort, and you are denying it. Is that right? Well, I did not say so. I just said that we could not see any signs of that happening because we could only depend on our own observation. However, I like to emphasize that I'm only talking about things as of today, but it doesn't mean that these will not happen later. So we can only keep watch of the situation, because, as I said, the development of、uh, financial centers would depend on competitiveness. But then, financial stability is our foundation. Without financial stability, the very foundation of Hong Kong will be shaken. So we will be watching the market very carefully. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Chen and your team. That's it for the item. Now we go into the. Next item: automatic exchange of financial account information in tax matters. Let it, let us invite the administration team to come in now. Let's welcome officials from the financial services and the treasury and、uh, other departments, including Miss Elizabeth Jam, Miss Mabel Chan, and、uh, Mr. Chiu Kwok Kit. If you are ready, please start. Thank you, Chairman. I am here to brief members on the. New international standard for exchange of financial account information. We call this the automatic exchange of financial account information, or AEOI. Actually, starting from July this year, the OECD, the Group 20, and also the Global Forum on Transparency and Exchange of Information for Tax Purposes, including 120 members, have one after another supported and agreed. To implement that international standard, Hong Kong, as、uh, a responsible、um, member of the global economy, we have also expressed to the global forum in September this year that we are happy to also adopt the AEOI. Today, I'm going to explain to you what the standard is and why we have to use it. In terms of exchange of taxation information, the policy objective is always that if we can help Hong Kong and our investment and trade partners, in order that we can expand our network of CDTA or Comprehensive Avoidance of Double Taxation Agreements, we'll be very happy to do it because、uh, this is a kind of、um, service. To taxpayers, however, because of international developments, even if、uh, there is no CDTA, our laws will ask us to set up a framework on the exchange of information,、uh, so that we will be able to sign agreements with our tax or trading partners. Now, why do we need so many tiers? If we are just talking about EOI arrangements,、um, why are we not just going for CDTAs? This is because we can see we have an international obligation in order to enhance taxation transparency,、um, and we need to exchange taxation information with our partners. At present. Whether we sign CDTA,、uh, this is comprehensive avoidance of double taxation agreements, or TIEA, T I E A, that is tax information exchange agreements, 
we only exchange information according to the mechanism, and uh, we only do it upon request, and we do it uh, with very strict confidentiality measures. Later on, we are going still to rely, rely on the request to exchange information, but we are going to also add in the standards for AEOI. Why are we making this commitment now? As I said earlier, the international community is committed to tackle offshore tax evasion. And in recent years, in terms of uh, uh, tax information exchange, the standard has been uh, increasing all the time. When we drafted the paper for discussion today, we understand that according to the OECD, there are 67 tax jurisdictions which have publicly committed to adopt the new standards. In fact, on the 29th of October, according to the latest information, there are all together 58 jurisdictions which have committed to, <coughs> to follow the new standards by 2017, and 35 has committed, including Hong Kong, to implement this uh, before the end of 2018. In other words, altogether, we're not talking about 67. As at the end of October, there will be there are 93 jurisdictions which have uh, undertaken to adopt the new standards. This year, the OECD uh, also uh, provided a new set of guidelines uh, for these standards for the benefit of the Jurisdiction, different jurisdictions. That is, they, would, they can all follow the same, same standard. Basically, the premise for automatic exchange of information is that uh, it should be on a reciprocal basis with appropriate partners. And these partners must be able to meet the requirements for protection of privacy and confidentiality of information exchange, and as well as the proper use of data. Next. I will briefly talk about what are the standards that we're talking about. If we say that we now only exchange information on request, uh, uh, basically we're talking about agreement between the tax jurisdictions uh, of two different territories. But under the AEOI standard, there will be one additional element, which is the financial institutions. Uh, it also stipulates that under the new standards, these financial institutions will have to report the uh, financial account information of their account holders according to the common reporting standard to the competent authority, and that they should periodically uh, report to the uh, the uh, competent authorities uh, every year, and the competent authority being the tax authorities. The competent authority, when they need to exchange information, they would need to have a G to G agreement with the counterparty. It could be bilateral. It could also be multilateral. The financial institution. I mean, what sort of standard should the financial institution follow in uh, providing such information? These are spelled out in the new standards, the new reporting standards. First of all, the scope of information to be reported. Let's say if you say open a bank account, there are two information which could be exchanged. Personal data, that is the name, the address, the tax residence of the account holder, the taxpayer's identification number. The second category would be the financial data, that is the account balance, the uh, investment income of the account holder, and the sales proceeds from financial assets. All these would need to be reported. So which are the financial institutions which will be required to report? They include four categories of institutions, including the banks, the custodians, insurance companies, and investment entities. There are several thousand such institutions in Hong Kong. 
regarding well the the scope of account holders subject to reporting could be individuals, entities including trusts and foundations, as well as controlling persons of such entities, namely the beneficial owners. The standard, the reporting standard, also requires financial institutions to conduct due diligence procedures. It is clearly explained how the due diligence procedures should be conducted, and for different accounts, there are different procedures and requirements. New requirements for new accounts and existing accounts, uh, accounts with large balances and small balances. Again, there will be different requirements uh, regarding due diligence. Other than regulating the financial institutions, uh, the new reporting standard also uh, has provided a sample uh, that is the, the, the sample model competent authority agreement and what it should include and the agreement or the model that is provided is to provide a legal basis for the exchange of such uh, uh, account information. Well such uh, uh, agreements could either be bilateral or multilateral, and it also provides for the modalities of the exchange, specifying the type of information to be exchanged and the time that the common authority should be provided such information. Also, uh, there are several clauses uh, regarding provisions on confidentiality and safeguards. By safeguards, it means that if the counterparty fails to uh, uh, observe confidentiality, so what sort of safeguards would there be? Uh, could the tax authorities immediately terminate the agreement? All these are, are explained in the model. The new standard. In the new standards, there are two key components, which have footnotes uh, explaining in detail uh, the meaning of the agreements and the model. It also provides technical guidelines, for example, on uh, uh, confidentiality, uh, what sort of encryption would need to be uh, used. So this is the most important uh, uh, slide. Uh, which has a direct bearing with let go because later on we may need to uh, consult you on that. To apply the new standards and directly all the different financial institutions and requiring them to provide such information, then of course we need the legal uh, uh, legis local legislation uh, to, to do that. What we are now thinking of is to amend the Indian Revenue Ordinance so that we need an enabling provision for AEOI so that we will be able to sign CDTAs or TIEAs. So what are the new legal requirements? As I said, financial institutions, we need to spell out clearly that we what what we due diligence will require the financial institutions to conduct and also how these institutions may store such data and and what are the reporting requirements. So so our requirements for the financial institutions will need to be clearly explained in the new in the new in the amendments. The IRD According to the uh, amendments, we have to explain, stipulate clearly that we should empower the ILD to, 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 to collect such information. And in respect of the new amendments, we will also ensure or we will propose safeguards to protect data privacy and confidentiality according to international standards. All the legislative proposals are rather complex, and we certainly will not under and underestimate the difficulty of the task. Uh, 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 so we need to st start 
working on this now, and Hong Kong has undertaken to implement or to uh, the AOI require uh, uh, by the end of 2018. In order to do to be able to sign the agreement by the end of 2018, the latest uh, it would be that we need to complete all the legislative process by 2017. We will also need to consult the financial institutions, the business chambers, and so on. Other than coming to this council, we will continue to conduct consultation exercises. The preliminary response we have received are, in general, supportive of Hong Kong's making this commitment to follow the new international standards. But regarding the practicalities, uh, 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 concerns have been expressed. There are also concerns about the question of compliance costs and whether or not it could be minimized, and that the tray uh, could. So, so what is required of the tray should be uh, uh, simplified, and also we should exercise caution in signing these uh, AEIO agreements. And also, they have reminded us of the need for safeguards to protect privacy and the confidentiality of information exchange. So these are the preliminary feedbacks that we have received. Uh, regarding the work ahead, it's not just that we, after we've made our commitment, we can, uh, you know, <coughs> uh, we'll be able to do our part of the work. But actually, we need to commit the news standard by October 2014 and announce our decision to implement the new requirement. And also, uh, in 2016-2016, uh, we will need to, uh, so there will be mutual assessment of, uh, of among the parties to the agreement. So we'll need to do our part, and by the end of 2018, uh, we have undertaken that that would be the latest that we would commence the first automatic exchange of information. On the domestic front, it is our plan to now hear to, 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 uh, to hear views and to prepare our detailed legislative proposals. This is a preliminary briefing of the way ahead. We hope that by 2016 we'll be able to uh, submit a bill to LegCo in 2016. Thank you. So four members have indicated that they would like to speak. Ronnie Tong, Starry Lee, Chen Gam Lang, and Mr. Lang Singh. Anyone else? If not, then I'll allow each member four minutes and uh, because we have a tight schedule. and. Uh, Run it all. I always think that when the government comes to consult us, they only do it when it's already something that is done. So you've already made a commitment. So what's the point of coming to consult us? You explained a lot about the details, but you, we have not had a, much discussion about the principle. My question, and I think the government would also agree, that Hong Kong under the common law system uh, has always maintained a position that we will not collect tax for other uh, countries and enact legislation for that purpose. Hong Kong is not a place for collecting tax for, from all over the world. I mean, the international corporations may require such exchange of information because the, 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 the place of domicile and the place where they operate the business may, may straddle different uh, territories. But for individual income, I don't see why there is a need for such exchange of tax information. As I said, Hong Kong is not a place where we would, uh, you know, collect tax globally. I mean, for other countries, this may be the case, such as the U.S. and Canada. So, regarding individual taxation, I like to ask. How such, what benefits will such exchange of information be of benefit for the people of Hong Kong? Thank you. Mr. Tong's concern had also been discussed internally among ourselves for a long time. That is whether or not we should be a pioneer in terms of exchange of information. Well, in fact, that is not the case. We understand that our policy objective is to avoid 
double taxation. That is the main objective. At the same time, we cannot deny that internationally uh, there are a lot of pressures and trends. Do these pressures come from the U.S. Uh, countries which collect taxation uh, globally? Y yes, indeed. Uh, we've noticed that there are many jurisdictions, uh, 60 some odd uh, jurisdictions, and recently uh, the number has gone up to 90. Uh, whether they collect tax globally or collect tax on a territorial basis like Singapore, they have already agreed to apply the new uh, automatic exchange of uh, uh, tax information. For jurisdictions which collect tax globally, of course, they would I'd like other jurisdictions to give them uh, tax information. Otherwise, they. But in Hong Kong, we do not have a, such a system. My question is very simple. What are the benefits for Hong Kong? Are we just helping places with global taxation to collect tax? Mr. Chair, as I said, Hong Kong has to discharge an international obligation. That is clear. In other words, to assist others in collecting taxes. Well, this is our understanding. But we don't rule out that at certain times when we have collected information that might help uh, Hong Kong's tax collection. What are those? Supposing, like me, I don't have any tax responsibilities or liabilities in other places, then under this AEOI, would my information be exchanged with other people? Sorry, Mr. Rani Tang, please allow her to answer. No, she talked three minutes without answering my question, but you gave her very little time. No, just tell us what are the advantages for Hong Kong people. Uh, please be more focused. But uh, if you don't do it, uh, I, I would say that uh, Hong Kong would lose our advantages. Well, yes, in Hong Kong, we have territorial tax collection. But we have also experienced where there was AEOI for Hong Kong, so we could uh, chase up on taxes. Maybe you can talk more. Why do we want to do this? Maybe the uh, commissioner for IRD can say something, Mr. Chiu, deputy commissioner. Thank you, Chairman. This is a new international standard, and it is a, a new international trend. The OECD spearheads it. We are not a, a pioneer or an early adopter. We just accept the standard because other people have already done it. But are there advantages for the IRD? Well, we uh, have a territorial taxation system. Now, I, I'm, I'm giving you. Um, an assumption. If, for example, somebody does not file all his uh, taxable income to the ILD, but some of the assets have been placed overseas, then under this AEOI, the ILD would be informed, and this will help the work of the IRD. Mr. Starley, Chairman, a simple low tax system is Hong Kong's advantage. And it is uh, very crucial for Hong Kong's preservation of competitiveness. Why do overseas investors come? Um, I think they look at the taxation system. Why do people come to work in Hong Kong? Uh, the comparatively low taxation system is something on their mind. So we have to preserve our competitiveness and not do any changes easily to our low taxation system. Don't send out the wrong message. Um, as we said many times in bills committees, we discuss this AEOI, and I'm sure it, it must be the U.S. or European countries uh, which have negative equities uh, that would propose such AEOI. And I'm sure when this is done, our enterprises can only respond to the seeking of information. And enterprises are already complaining that compliance cost is always going up. And once there is AEOI, they would have to answer many questions. But I understand, uh, as the PS and the Deputy Commissioner have said, this is a, an international trend. I'd like to ask, if we don't do this, will it be like last time where the international financial um, organizations would put in a black mark and uh, affect our status. And secondly, the countries that ha have negative equities would be uh, looking for opportunities to collect tax, and they would be asking many, many questions. So if this is implemented, how can you 
um, make sure that there will not be such a fishing expedition. Thank you. Um, first, if we do not apply the new standard, how do we view Hong Kong's competitiveness? We believe there will be a high chance for Hong Kong to be marginalized. And we are worried that if we do not follow the international trend, our reputation, our competitiveness would be um, affected and people would say that Hong Kong is a tax haven or tax evasion haven. And the Global Forum, in fact, will kick start a peer review system. Uh, we mentioned that uh, the process is very strict, but then the hundred odd global forum members will be able to conduct a peer review on you, uh, whether you comply with international standards in terms of exchange of taxation information. So we have to discharge our duty and let people see that, in fact, Hong Kong can follow basic international standards. That is important. Ms. Tari Lee, i like the PS to say this clearly. Is it that if we do not follow, we will be put in a uh, blacklist? W w would that happen? Uh, I understand the system you are telling me. The business sector and members of the public would have to know whether you are already cornered before you come to LegCo. Can you answer my question? PS. Yes, I can say that if we had a choice, we would have gone for CDTAs and TIEAs, and that is to exchange information only on request. The member asked whether we would be put in a blacklist. Uh, in fact, there will be this peer review mechanism of the global forum. Experience tells us if uh, people assess you and think that you don't follow the standard or not following the standard, completely, then uh, they can call you not compliant or partially compliant, and that will have a, a, a true impact on Hong Kong's reputation. Then how can you prevent fishing expeditions? P.S. Well, according to the latest OECD standards, the information sought should be able to comply with foreseeable relevant considerations. Mr. Chen Kam Lam, Chairman. Certainly, we support the uh, compliance with an international standard and discharging our international accountability. You say there will be uh, common reporting <coughs> standards. My understanding would be the um, banking or financial institutions for parties who have signed the agreements. But as you know, very often the investment accounts may not be opened locally. Like in Hong Kong, many people deposit their money in other countries where the institutions practice confidentiality. So how can you make sure that these uh, common reporting standards can be implemented by all relevant financial institutions? Will there be loopholes? I'd like to know how this will actually be implemented. P.S. Thank you. Maybe my colleague can supplement later. But as far as I know, the reportable financial institutions for Hong Kong are registered in Hong Kong or that they do business in Hong Kong. Their branches outside Hong Kong are not Hong Kong reportable institutions. Deputy Commissioner, under the AEOI system, now if we have the legal framework for it, then our responsibility will be to give the information of an overseas tax resident, uh, including the interest he receives. Um, we give the information to the Overseas Taxation um, Institute, uh, that is the information of uh, the place of origin of this tax resident. Well, maybe the officials did not understand my question. 
it will may be easy for the average member of the public because their investments and assets will be deposited with local financial institutions. So it's easy for you to implement the common reporting standards, but other people may not do it like this. They may have accounts in the U.S. or Canada and at the same time Hong Kong. And their assets may be placed in overseas financial institutions that practice confidentiality. How can you implement these common reportable standards um, on these financial institutions? Say, for example, the U.S. asks for information of a certain person. This person works and lives in Hong Kong. Now, how can we find the information for the U.S.? If we are amiss in any way, will we give people the inf impression that uh, we are covering for this person so we do not com uh, comply with the international standards? How, how do you assess the situation? P.S. Between Hong Kong and the U.S., we are already discussing FATCA. But let me not use the U.S. example. Uh, FECA is the United States Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act. Okay, let me just talk about a Hong Kong person who pays tax in Hong Kong. And the account information of this person does not have to be given to another place. But if I'm a Hong Kong person but I have an account in Canada, if Hong Kong and Canada sign the AEOI, then the Canadian financial institutes should be able to check the relevant information and that information will be sent to the IRD in Hong Kong. Mr. Ng Lang Singh. Thank you, Chairman. Internationally, there are new requirements for mutual assistance. We all know that this started with the U.S. Either they have uh, too many enemies or they are too poor. We need it, not spend more time on it. But let us be more focused. We are an international financial center, and we want to know what will happen if other financial centers take part but we don't take part. However, if everybody takes part, if PRC is also a member, and since Hong Kong is an international financial center, then do we actually have any choices? It is not up to us to stall anymore. Let us talk about the stakeholders, and that is the financial institutions, and what they have to look out for so they can comply with the standards. Now, usually, uh, we are law-abiding. We hope the present situation in Hong Kong where people do not comply with the law will not impress upon the world that we are not law-abiding. But we have always been law-abiding, so we will not likely not take part in mutually um, beneficial international standards. Now, if we have to comply with such standards, what kind of compliance cost there will be? Because eventually, it will have to be transferred to the public. As a financial institution, we are concerned about the compliance cost because there may be more regulation coming in and the Regulators will hire more people to regulate the relevant institutions and we have to have a bigger compliance department for the purpose. And all that add to our cost. This is not for marketing and it is not about products but only to comply with supervisory necessities. This is my worry. And also, if there is no um, mechanism to compel all partners to sign, then I would say we do the minimum. 
Mr. Chair, as I said, in the whole wide world, over 90 uh, tax jurisdictions have agreed to use the new standard. Uh, our competitor, Singapore, and also uh, Switzerland and other major trading partners have also committed to apply the new standard either in 2017 or 2018. And the Global Forum members, among the hundred odd of them, only five have not indicated when they can make an undertaking. So if Hong Kong really does not in discharge our international obligation, uh, I, I do think that we will be marginalized. I agree that uh, in the next few months, we will have to do something concrete to see what kind of impact there will be on financial institutions, including costs. Within the administration, the ILD also needs to study uh, what extra resources we need. But uh, our principle is uh, to keep it to the minimum. Mr. Chawa Fong, the I think our industry has discussed this uh, issue of uh, the exchange of information. We all agree that we should honour our international obligations, but there are also uh, difficulties. When a client comes to open an account in a company, they will open an account with an ID card. They, he, the customer may have other nationalities, but they don't disclose that to us. So if this were found out later on, who should be held responsible? Secondly, we are a security brokerage firm. We we do not have any connection with overseas companies. So in that case, do we really need to, you know, uh, you know, uh, implement our, or or discharge our international obligation obligations? Thirdly, after the handover, many of our customers have em emigrated, and and they still maintain a good relationship with a security firm. My guess is that many of the SME security firms still have these old customers like that, and many of them have actually emigrated already. And if this policy were implemented, I believe we will lose many. Our customers will 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 will, will, will suffer, uh, you know, uh, a, a heavy loss. So, will this reporting? How will this reporting mechanism affect our industry? What will be cost implications, and how can we resolve this issue? Oh, do you have any policies that can help us? If you have a locally registered uh, brokerage firm, which do not have any, you know, branches overseas, could they be exempted? Let me ask. Uh, Mabel will I'll take the second or third part of your question. Your first question is about someone opening an account with a Hong Kong ID card, but he still has other identities and he doesn't disclose that. So what happens to the bank? Well, the guideline actually provide, you know, for the due diligence procedure. That is, the bank or the financial institution would need to uh, look at the information it has available to see whether there are any any discrepancies or any information that would uh, not be in compliance, and see whether or not he can identify whether the person should pay uh, tax to any tax jurisdictions. Besides that. The account holder would also need to make a declaration himself. If the customer is not being honest, then the financial institution would not be held liable for that. So, so according to these uh, reporting standards, indeed there are certain grey areas which we need to. Uh, consult the industry, and when we identify any problems, then we can ask uh, f ask uh, follow up questions on how uh, how these uh, grey areas could be tackled, and we'll try our best to reduce costs. If the customer opened an account with a Hong Kong ID card, he in the course of our conversation, the customer would tell us that. Uh, uh, I, I came across somebody in Canada. I, I'm there in winter or in summer, and it shows that. But they, they don't tell us. So in that case, would you say that we've already done our part? Should we try to further verify about his nationality? 
Well, the guideline said also said that if the person makes a declaration, but you have reasons uh, to to believe that he's not giving you the the, the the full truth, the whole truth, then you may need to take some measures. So if you're doing business and you've identified customer, then I mean a, a regulation like that would simply make it impossible for us to to, to develop our business. Uh, I think Mr. Jones' concerns are understandable. Earlier, during a brief, the briefings were held. We've also, uh, uh, you know, uh, approached the global forum about these issues raised. Uh, the whole purpose is that the account holder would need to be an overseas tax uh, resident. Uh, the important thing is that the client holder, when he open the account, he need to declare certain information. And also his uh, overseas tax identity. Of course, the uh, due diligence pr procedure requires the financial institution to follow certain steps. That is under the common reporting standards. Uh, he would need to uh, uh, look at verify the 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 residence of the account holder, and also the origin of the proceeds which the account receives. The client manager through his daily contact with the account holder, if he is aware of certain information, that at the com the reporting standard also stipulates that the financial institution will need to adopt some measures and ask questions. But so long as the financial institution has gone through all those procedures, then it will be absolved of any responsibility. We've actually clarified this point with the global forum. The important thing is that the financial institution will need to go through a series of procedures. After it has done it, done that, it will not be held responsible. For the next round, we have Ronnie Tong and Ng Leung Singh. Three minutes each. Ronnie Tong, Chairman, I'd like to follow up. I'm very surprised by the Deputy Secretary's response. I think in Hong Kong, the tax system is very simple. For the uh, salaries tax, I think you don't, you don't, uh, and for income tax, unless the income is based on Hong Kong activities, otherwise uh, overseas uh, uh, rev, rev income from overseas sources are not subject to tax. So, what are the benefits to the people of Hong Kong? The secretary said that there are examples where we can obtain tax information from other jurisdictions and help Hong Kong, uh, you know, collect tax. Can you tell us how many such cases there are in a year? Uh, for which we need tax information from other jurisdictions to help you collect personal uh, taxes. Thank you. To answer Mr. Tong's question, well, this is a new framework. Uh, there is no legal basis to it yet. The automatic exchange of information. I, I mean, I mean well, I, I gave a hypothetical example just now. Like if you are a taxpayer uh, doing business in Hong Kong, but it doesn't disclose its income to the IRD and you place it with an overseas account, then under the new framework, then we would be able to access such information to help the IRD. Sorry, I think your assumption is not, uh, you know, uh, cannot be accepted. If the person has income in Hong Kong, it doesn't uh, report that he's in breach of law. If he plays it outside of Hong Kong, how would he dis uh, why would he discuss such information? I think your example is a bit far fetched. Deputy Commissioner. Uh, Chairman, what I meant was that if the taxpayer has not accurately reported his income uh, and on that basis if he places uh, income overseas then through the new framework we'll be able to access such information. How can that be? He doesn't report such uh, income overseas. He doesn't even report it in Hong Kong. Why would it that he will report his income overseas? And if he doesn't do that, how can you have such information? Well, he's a Hong Kong tax resident. According to this framework, the tax jurisdictions overseas will, uh, you know, give his account information to the, uh, the to our ILD, and this shows that. Uh, foreign tax residents, their, uh, their tax information in Hong Kong can be forwarded to uh, overseas tax jurisdictions and by uh, accessing the income information, I understand 
that the system can help the tax authorities in overseas jurisdictions, and that is the crux of the question. Uh, that is, you uh, you own you you can help other jurisdictions collect tax, but it's not vice versa. Well, I think you can certainly. You know, discuss that in more informally uh, in detail, uh, Mr. Nang Sheng. I think it's getting more and more complicated. Some funds, when they come to Hong Kong, uh, some are held in the name of an individual or in the name of an organization or a political party. So, under the new exchange of information system, I don't know. Uh, what we need to do. I mean, it's not a joke. You may have some funds which are coming to Hong Kong, which are commercial in nature. It could be the Apple Daily or certain media organization uh, coming in the name of advertising uh, expenses, and some coming in the name of a democratic foundation. And we don't know whether they are political donations or they are rewards or income for certain people <coughs> or helping them to uh, collect more advertisements. So you cannot differentiate between politics and business. Also, we have the, 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 the so-called U.S. Center at the Chinese University. The Hong Kong U also has received certain funding to conduct an opinion polls. So somebody gave money to somebody and then gave it uh, to the university and so on. For such incomes in future, if we have to follow the, the, the compliance uh, standard uh, for EOI, does it mean that the government will have to hire more people to conduct investigation? And more importantly, will there be sufficient transparency so that we can resolve this problem? But at the same time, we have to. We need to strike a bar, proper balance between, you know, whether we can protect privacy on the one hand and and. and Access the information. Well, it doesn't mean that after collecting this information, we will, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, send them overseas uh, automatically. First, we must have an agreement to ensure that the counterparty has similar safeguards for the protection of privacy before the government will consider signing that agreement with the jurisdiction. Using the example, we use it. Uh, Hong Kong signs an agreement with jurisdiction B on the exchange of information, then the, f f the banks or financial institutions in Hong Kong, the balance of the, the accounts of the person, the investment income, dividend income, proceeds from trading in stocks and financial products, all such financial information, according to the new standard, then the financial institution will submit such information to the IOD once a year, and then we'll forward it to jurisdiction B, tax jurisdiction B. And the exchange information will need to observe the strict uh, requirement for confidentiality. So because other than the IOD, do you need to exchange information with police stations? Well, this is mainly... Uh, uh, we're mainly talking about the uh, competent authority, namely the tax authorities. The counterparty, after receiving some information, cannot disclose them to other, uh, you know, uh, authorities or organizations. And the data would need to be related to tax matters. If the CCB needs to investigate into certain commercial crimes, the tax concern may be related to the uh, offences. Then, you, in that case, you need to exchange information with police authorities. I think the common reporting standard requires us to use the CDTA and tier agreement. For the C CDTA and tier agreement, there is provision for the protection of privacy and that information cannot be disclosed to any, any parties outside other than the tax authorities. If there are exceptional circumstances where the law in the jurisdiction concern uh, uh, has uh, have provision for tackling serious crime or money laundering, and if the two uh, partners 
have such a, a, a exchange of information mechanism only under such a stringent mechanism will the information uh, transfer to the relevant authorities. But this would need to be clearly stipulated in the agreement, and that agreement will need to be ratified by LegCo. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we can wrap up our discussion on this item. And we move on to the last item, which is the consultancy services for the proposed joint user government office building in Chengshawan. We invite the administration to join us. Ah, we welcome the administration representatives. If you have settled down, please take us through the paper. Members, please note that um, if you have uh, or if you perceive a possible uh, need to declare interest, please do so before you ask questions. Thank you, Chairman. The administration is planning to build a new joint user government office in Changsha Wan, and we are proposing to engage consultancy services. Our policy is to accommodate its offices in government owned properties as circumstances admit and relocate non location bound government offices out of high value areas. To act with this policy at the junction of Tong Chao Street and Tong Kin Street West in Changsha Wan, we propose to build a new joint user government office building, and we propose to call it the Treasury Building. We'll be able to provide 23,600 meters square of net operational floor area, and this is really to accommodate the five bureaus departments accommodated in the three government offices buildings in Wan Chai Waterfront, and three departments accommodated in leased private premises in Wan Chai Mong Kok, Cheng Sha Wan, and Kowloon Bay. The reprovisioning will help us start the reprovisioning or relocation of the departments in the three Wan Chai buildings and also to provide a um, stable office accommodation for other departments and then we can release the uh, supply of grade A office spaces. We expect to be able to have an annual saving in rental expenditure of up to about $26 million. Some of the offices to be relocated to the Treasury Building will provide convenient frontline services to the public, including a catering and retail industries center for recruitment of the Labor Department, and there will also be a general outpatient clinic operated by the hospital authority. The Treasury Building will first be designed by a consultant, and then we will commission a contractor to do the building works. The pre-construction consultancy and site investigation works will cost a price in accordance with the um, actual situation and also recent consultancy prices. And the estimate is $103.2 million in money of the day prices. If we will get the support of the FC of LegCo, or we have the support of this panel, then we will make the proposal and submit it to the PWSC and the FC. And we expect by June 2015, we'll commission the commission, uh, the consultant to do the design and sign investigation and for it to be completed in 2017. Then we will seek funding from the FC for the construction and other associated works. We hope the panel will support our project and we'll be happy to take questions. 
Okay, two members would like to ask questions. Ms. Dari Lee and Mr. Ng Leung Singh. Uh, would anyone else like to answer ask questions? Also, Mr. Chen Kam Lam, three minutes each. Ms. Lee. Chairman, the DAB always supports and actually we have always asked the administration to arrange for the reprovisioning of the Wan Chai offices as soon as possible so we can release um, business sites in the CBD. And then at the same time, you can also bring government services to other districts so there will be the possibility of district economies. So we support this building. When the introduction was done, it is said that the reprovisioning of Wan Chai offices would have to be done in phases. But you remember, this was a proposal in the Donald Zhang era. A few years have passed already. And if you can add according to the timetable of the paper, does it mean that the Wan Chai offices can be vacated for business activities? Number two, if not, then what about the overall relocation timetable? Apart from having a joint user building in Changsha Wan, now my observation is, and I stand to be corrected, uh, my observation is because of historical legacy, many joint user government offices are only in Hong Kong and Kowloon, but uh, not many of them in the NT. Are there plans to build such joint user buildings in the NT so you can bring services to those districts and also so there will be help for district economies? Mr. Young, thank you. The three buildings in Wan Chai um, involve 29 departments with over 10,000 uh, members working there. We need time to get prepared. And we need to discuss with the departments uh, when they will move out. So we are going to do it in phases. You remember at the beginning of the year when we came to the panel, we asked you about relocating offices to West Kowloon government offices because um, that will be built. When the WKGO is completed, some of the offices in one child will be moved to West Kowloon. We expect to come back within this legislative session to ask for funding support. Um, yes, I think uh, you should be more focused. Please answer those questions because you have spent over a minute or so, but you have not touched upon those um, questions. We expect the WK office to be completed in 2018-2019, and the Cheng Shawan building uh, will start as building works in 2017. But in fact, in Kai Tech Development Area and in Chiang Kwan O, we have already marked sites for government offices for reprovisioning purposes. So we are going to move out from the Wan Chai offices in phases. The third question has to do with where the new John user buildings will be. As I said, there will be one in Kai Tech and also another one in Chiang Kwan O. And, and these will be in Kowloon and the NT. A brief follow-up. When can you vacate the three office buildings in Wan Chai? Very briefly, please, just your estimate. Right now, we cannot have any final timetable. Since we are going to build user buildings in a few places, so you do not have a concrete timetable, Mr. Ng Leung Singh. Thank you, Chairman. In principle, I support reasonable use of land. So if you will move out from one Chai, I will support it. Since many members are not here, um, you will have to go to PWSC and FC, and I would ask you that um, you should liaise with members who are not here to seek their support. Um, I think they should, because if they don't support it, they should be here to ask questions. And I hope uh, you will get your funding 
support smoothly, or else uh, if they adopt an uncooperative campaign, then it will be a waste of time. I'd like to ask about the NOVA, 23,600 square meters. Is that a maximum of the plot ratio? Or else can you not build a taller building to have more NOVA? Uh, so that there will be more facilities. I agree that you spread out to the districts. Can you not have some floor area for recreational use, uh, especially to accommodate the elderly? Since you provide an outpatient clinic to benefit the elderly, why don't you also try to find some space in the new joint user building uh, for elderly recreation? like lawn ball or something. I'm not talking about a swimming pool. No, not that type. So you can serve the public better. DS, thank you. Can I ask the government property administrator to answer the question? We'll do follow-up work. When we go to PWSC, um, uh, we hope the funding request will be supported. The plot ratio is 8, and we have maximized it. The height will be about 100 meters, including 20 floors. This is what the Shamshepo District Council can accept. If the building will be taller, there may be some impact on nearby buildings which may not be acceptable to the DC. As for NOFA, we will provide public spaces for uh, recreation by the public. Mr. Chen Kam Lam, I support the project. I hope it will be constructed as soon as possible. Just now, Ms. Lee asked about the reprovisioning of the three Wan Chai buildings. You could not give us a timetable, but my specific question is, when will you start projects in Kai Tech? When are you going to confirm the sites? Because then we will be able to know when the reprovisioning of the Wan Chai offices will be completed. Secondly, the Hong Kong Post now operates on its own trading fund. Why do we have to accommodate the Chiang Shawan Post Office in the new building? Why shouldn't uh, Hong Kong Post fend for itself? And then, is it that the entire treasury will be housed there? The OG CIO is also in Wan Chai now. Will the entire government information office be moved to the new building? I, I hope that will happen, or else uh, the, they will be scattered all over the place. DS, uh, you only have a minute or so. Please cover all the questions. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, the entire treasury. We'll move there. I will ask the GPA to tell you about the post office. Chairman, I think Mr. Chen knows that we are building another um, treasury and industry John user building in Kai Tech. It will be completed in April next year. But that is really to accommodate the TNI from Mong Kok. And it is a separate matter from the reprovisioning of the Wan Chai Towers. My uh, Our plan is that in Kai Tech, there will be another government office building to reprovision the Wan Chai offices, and we'll come back to you at the appropriate time. As for the post office, it is now in commercial premises. We'll reprovisioning it, reprovision it to the John User building so we can save on rent. Chairman. The Chengsha Wan building will have 
Nova only of uh, about twenty three thousand, but in one child you have a hundred and seventy thousand. In other words, there is a big shortfall. You say in Kai Tech there will be another project, but is it big enough to reprovision um, all the one child towers? Uh, Before the officials reply, I propose that we extend the meeting by fifteen minutes. I'll give you a minute to to respond. Thank you. At Kai Tech and Chengguanhou, we have. Earmark some sites for the building of new complexes. The plans are still ongoing. At the appropriate time, we will consult this council uh, and report to members. So, uh, me do members support the proposal that we submit this uh, project to the PWSC and the FC for deliberation? Thank you very much. With that, we can wrap up our discussion on this item. I'd like to thank the officials for coming. Do we have AOB? If not, we may now adjourn. Thank you.